Hi, and welcome to the latest episode of Wall Street Wildlife with your hosts, Luke and Christoph. Christoph, you've got a different background back there. You're somewhere other than the uh, the scorched earth that is Austin in the summer, I gather. Buongiorno, Luke. Uh, io sono alla uh, Ila Encanta di Sicilia. Ooh. You're Italian, please don't be offended. <laughs> <laughs> You're in beautiful Italy, though. Yeah, southern Italy with Greek and Arabic and Islamic and Italian roots. That's what Sicily is made of. And I've been busy stuffing my face with donuts full of cannolis. <laughs> what have you been up to? We just had a big uh, birthday weekend in the Hallard house. My wife uh, had a birthday. We took <laughs> delivery by surprise to her of the new... Uh, Tesla Model 3 Highland on her birthday. So uh, she says it's not a birthday present because we were getting it anyway. Anyway, she got other gifts. But we now have a uh, black Tesla Model 3 with a white interior because I was so taken by your own white interior and your Model 3 performance. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful machine. Oh, yeah, black and white. That's nice. I could see that rolling along smoothly and the streets of London in that fine machine. Are the differences pretty big? This Highland, which if you're a, a Tesla acolyte, you'll realize is the brand new, the updated, refreshed Model 3, and they've got rid of interesting stuff. So you no longer have any of these little stalks behind the uh, steering wheel. If you want to indicate, there's buttons under your left thumb. Also like a high beams, like flash the lights button. And if you want to change gear, that's on the screen. It tries to be smart. When you sit in the car, plug in your seatbelt, driver's seatbelt, it then assumes you probably want to go forward. I think it probably looks at the cameras as to which way you want to go. So it just says, like, depress the brake pedal. When you press the brake, it automatically puts itself into gear, ready to get rolling. It's interesting. I thought I wouldn't like having the indicators and these things as buttons, yeah. but I've only driven the thing like 50 miles in the city over the weekend, and already... Having stalks feels like archaic and old. I much prefer the buttons now. It didn't take long to convert. Oh, that's so fascinating. That reminds me of when the Apple, there was the whole big to-do about them getting rid of the button on whatever iPhone. You don't know because you live in the Android cave. But the rest of us evolved humans have the, you know, went through the button, no button evolution and there was a big to-do, you know, don't get rid of our button. How could you get, you know, how can you, do the swipey thing and the swipey thing turns out is second nature though i wonder when you were saying that you know like i guess in normal trafficy par for course situations i could see why it's not a big deal but let's say something crazy is happening on the road and you need to i guess switch direction but you have your old memory of you need to you know do something manually could that possibly be a source of trouble like I guess none of those things are safety critical. Like you're not, it's not like you're in a manual car where you're going to be handbrake turning and doing like crazy shit to maneuver around something in front of you. Like if, you, if you're switching from forward into reverse or if you're indicating, these are all obviously very important functions of the car, but they're probably not functions that will come into play in the, the one second before you actually have a potential impact, right? So I guess they're easier things. Like if you moved, I don't know, the horn or you moved the brake somewhere else, that would obviously be a relatively substantial change to the user experience. Okay, so you're not seeing that with uh, with this revamp. I buy it. Uh, I quite like it. I, th I thought maybe I wouldn't get on with it. To be honest, actually, uh, Katrina hasn't got behind the wheel yet because it's been a pretty boozy weekend as well. And so uh, I'll probably get some complaints from her when she's like, where is the indicator? But yeah, I'm sure she'll figure it out. Well, congratulations on joining Team White Leather. This is yeah. one of these intangibles as far as investments go. That old adage, you know, buy what you know or buy what you love. And you talk about the white leather. On the surface, it's meaningless. I mean, really, it, it, it makes no difference whatsoever. But for me, that car is the only object, save for maybe the iPhone, which I kind of feel continues to give more as a material object because of how good it makes me feel aesthetically or in terms of just you know the not the poshness i wouldn't call it poshness but something about it feels good and that those kinds of things are hard to 
replicate. And so, you know, um, not a small thing when you're an investor and you notice something like that is alive for you in your own world. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Like, I do try and avoid spending money on stuff. I'd rather spend money on experiences. But you're right, that sort of sits in a bit of a gray zone, get an element of experience. And there's an element of, like, due diligence on the company. Like, I'm not saying I've got a Model 3's worth of DD benefit out of it for my Tesla shareholding, but I've got some additional insight into the trajectory of the company. To be fair, I probably got more insight when I sat in your Model 3 with actual FSD. But it's useful to keep track of the company's design aesthetic and uh, engineering skills. Yeah, right on. What else, uh, anything else you want to add to the experience of buying uh, yourself, I mean, your wife, uh, <laughs> a, a birthday present? Like it is, it, does, it reminded me how easy it is compared to, I don't know, I've, I've probably owned, I don't know, 25 motorbikes over the years and I've owned maybe 15 cars up until I bought my first Tesla. And, uh, you know, it's always a bit of a trying experience buying a, well, a new or a used motor vehicle, but it's just very easy with Tesla. Uh, it's all done in the app. I was very happy, like paying the full invoice, like a week ahead of picking the thing up because I'm relatively confident they're not about to go out of business or scam me. There was no element of negotiating or debating as the price you pay. It's just kind of low stress. And it's quite nice. The buying experience itself is quite nice. You know, went along to my local Tesla, not dealership, I don't know what you call them, like store. And then out back in the car park, they had like a container that they converted into like a little office with some coffee and tea. There was a little gang of enthusiastic looking boys and girls there ready on the morning when I arrived to pick up their own cars. Um, but it's interesting to hear all this conversation with regard to your car in the context of many Tesla investors saying loudly, Tesla's not a car company. And yet, you know, the, the whole process from beginning to end, mm -hmm. the way Tesla has now upgraded that is, is huge. It's a significant chunk of its identity, I'd say, regardless of all the other stuff going on. I'll tell you I, what, yeah. what was a nice little random bonus. Uh, so like just an hour ago, I got an email from Tesla saying, as a thank you for taking delivery this quarter, please have 15,000 miles of free supercharging. Didn't expect that. Oh. So pretty happy. Oh, there you go. Where are you going? Yeah, well, well, we're heading to the Paris Olympics in August. So uh, I'll be spending some of that free supercharging on the way there and back. That'd be handy. Oh, you'll be driving there? Uh, ferry? Uh, the tunnel goes under the channel. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Okay. We invested in some fabulous infrastructure, built a tunnel so you can drive. Well, not drive. You do drive onto a train and the train takes you across to the continent. But at the same time as building this fabulous bit of infrastructure, we then sort of in parallel uh, created all this political challenge with Brexit. And uh, I'm seeing even today on Twitter, people bemoaning like multiple hour queues at Frankfurt Airport. I'm kind of Brexit immune because I've got my Irish passport, but... Uh, it's not pretty. Uh, the country's done something very dumb there. I'll refrain from any politic commentary this week. Let's not go there, but we've got an election coming up in the UK very soon, next three or four weeks, I think. Got a snap general election that's been called. So uh, looking forward to that. A chance yes. to vote out the current incumbent party. In, I think the, the main feature of today's episode is we'd like to update you on the King of the Jungle challenge as a way of talking about, I suppose you know, what we see are the best opportunities in the market and highlighting our approach to this contest. It's month seven, right? Yeah. At the moment, Badger is still whooping monkey's ass to the tune of, looks to be approximately 1900 to about 1300 So I'm about 600 bucks behind, which is sizable. But I noticed you made a nice little recovery. Yes. It's a lead, but you've closed it in the last week or two. What's happened? I've closed yeah. the gap a little bit, but I'm actually really enthusiastic because nothing I'll say to you is new, but I only had three small cap companies in the portfolio. My Tesla position is really, really tiny, so it's not going to make a difference. But all three of those small caps are bets on undervalued very risky. It's overstating it, but they're not all zero or moonshots, but they have extraordinarily high potential for reward, but also with reward comes a lot of risk. 
I was advocating for Seven Investing for us to consider introducing into the portfolio, and that's uh, Iris Energy, because I really, really love the way they're building up their computing data infrastructure from the ground on up and becoming both a Bitcoin miner and also provider for future AI data warehouses. And it it seems drastically undervalued relative to all the others. And as of, I guess, last week, it returned over 100%. So it went from something like five when I bought it up to 11 at some point. So it's actually more than 100%. Why have they increased in value so much over such a short period? I think these are the weird gyrations of short-term market. The value is there to see. And what's hard for investors often is when the value is visible and nothing really has changed, why or when does the market finally start to recognize it? The most obvious reason for the change is that Bitcoin has gone up in value, but it hasn't really gone up that much since a couple of months ago. But I think it's part of the speech I've been uh, given is that I think Bitcoin regulatory conditions or rather crypto regulatory conditions are becoming more favorable. It's becoming a driving political force. And this is at the moment, I think one of the best run miners in the space and it was undervalued. So at some point, big buyers come in and then that whole perception thing turns around. It kind of gets a little bit into that technical analysis stuff where price is a self-fulfilling engine, if you will, but you just have to have enough patience to wait it out. The other thing I'll say about it is that earnings were within the last month and the company more or less said it's perfectly well capitalized to take advantage of becoming one of the strongest miners in the space in terms of the hash rate. So that means in terms of the amount of computing power they have at their disposal. So they'll be mining more Bitcoin. They're shaping up to be one of the top three miners. And so what you're seeing in this industry, and I know you don't care that much, (laughs) but for most of our listeners or for anybody interested in crypto, this is a kind of doggy dog world where you have to have enough computing power to make it. And if you don't, the economics no longer work and you die. And then all of that mining gets done by the top. So it's sort of like starting to siphon into the players that are going to make it. So I picked well at the moment. One thing I've always been a bit skeptical about with your Bitcoin miners is kind of links into what you just said. Like you do have to spend a ton of capex to buy mining hardware. And then presumably that mining hardware is going out of date every six months or every year. And to stay competitive, you have to keep buying the latest generation of graphics cards, whatever kind of hardware the guys use. How how does that make sense? What do the miners do with their kit? How do they avoid it becoming just like generating tons and tons of technological waste as they can't use previous generations of technology? Yeah, well, unfortunately, I'm not an expert in the the precise details about this, but this is one of the main reasons I really liked Iris is because they're doing both data warehousing and putting all those chips to use in the future growth of AI cloud. And, you know, the history of Bitcoin is short right now, but what we know is that from its inception to, what is it, 16 years later, the chart, it's been the best performing asset class, maybe in the, I don't know, the history of assets, but it's certainly like astronomical growth. So the view historically is that the appreciation in price more than makes up for the investment in CapEx. So then they're mining, but they're also holding crypto on their own books. Iris is actually not holding crypto. They're selling it right away to invest in their CapEx and increase the speed and so forth. Ah, Okay, but they benefit from the appreciation of Bitcoin because the stuff they're mining is more valuable. Right. And at the time I was advocating for it, we could see that the relative value of its assets was compared to what the price of Bitcoin was, was so low that the market had little choice but to bid up the value of the company. I mean, it's one of those, you know, I call timely arbitrage situations. Okay. All right. Well, look, hey, it's uh, whatever they're doing, it's working out for you in the contest because it's closing the gap. 
But here's why I'm excited. I was able to then sell 20% of those shares at, uh, I think my first lot was only at 60% gains because I added some more as the price went down. And I reallocated the, that capital to more shares of Coherus and more Coherus options dated for January 25. So here's for all of you keeping track at home. Um, most of my losses have been due to my options expiring worthless. So that's cost me, uh, I think, about 300 something dollars for the contest. But I'm doubling down on that approach. And at this point, in this moment of the contest, I control approximately 500 shares of Coherus, 300 shares outright plus two options of 100 shares each. So if the inflection point that I've been waiting for does happen in the next quarter or two, then more or less every dollar the company gains will net me about $500 in portfolio value. So that gap could close conceivably quickly if, of course, I'm right about Coheres. As ever, if you're at home managing your own investment portfolio, do not try to mimic what Christoph is doing because it's a very high-risk strategy. And, and if you're doing it just to win the contest, okay, great. But you know, I hope you're not doing something similar in your main portfolio because if the company doesn't appreciate Again, you're just massively overexposed to it. And especially using derivatives, like a chunk of your capital could go to zero. Right. So this goes back to the risk management. And in my main portfolio, Coheres is my number one position. But I am not adding, even though I'm adding in this contest because of risk management principles. So for the contest purposes, I'm actually feeling pretty good because I have my three companies are still quite undervalued during a time when the market is pretty frothy. So let's see what happens in the next two months. Okay. Well, I wish you well. Uh, as ever, I've not done much in my King of the Jungle portfolio, although I am about to buy Palantir. It's, one, it's a stock I bought for my own personal portfolio a couple of weeks ago. I think I'm going to add a chunk of Palantir to my uh, my king of the jungle portfolio as well. I asked you some questions about Palantir on our investor conversations at Seven Investing, and I buy what you're selling. And yet, you know how hard it is to change one's mind, you know, like deep down. I still worry about the company in the sense that I worry about technology being abused. In a sense, through no fault necessarily of the company's own. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but can you explain for people who might hold the same Orwellian suspicions that any company that is in cahoots with, say, the government and big data, that they won't sell out, I guess, our personal data and infringe on our liberties? Well, I can't, no, because they possibly are doing that. But... I'm willing to be a shareholder and support the company's mission regardless, because I feel they're also doing important things for the West's military capability. What's the Spider-Man quote? With great power comes great responsibility. Here we have one of the world's greatest software platforms for analyzing data at scale and drawing inferences and forming plans I suppose I'd rather those tools were in the hands of the West, given today's geopolitical climate. So if those tools can also be turned towards the citizens of the West, then I don't know, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that's just something I'm eating as a shareholder, that nefarious things might be happening. Yeah, it's a tough moment uh, for humanity. It seems like more and more um, lines that you can't walk back from have already been crossed. So with a company like Palantir, I'll just state for investment purposes, I'm intrigued by the company. I'm intrigued by the technology. I could see it being a wildly successful investment, but there's something still too gray area-ish in it for me from an ethics perspective that doesn't allow me to be comfortable with it as an investor. And therefore, not to say that you're, you, you know, I wish you all the best and I hope that you are right. I hope that 
these are the kinds of tools that have to be used for good to keep off well good from our perspective um but when there's this kind of grayness and i don't often resort to ethical or moral lines in the sand but when one is clear to me then i will choose to simply say too hard and and kind of wash my hands clean and hope everything works out for the best yeah that's fair and everyone's ethics and principles are different and a ton of people make good money investing in the tobacco industry that's personally one i don't see any upsides to i just see downsides so i'll stay away from that but if other folk want to make money that way then fair enough i guess so i think about ethics and morality quite a bit and it's complex i i think in in one way what luke said is right investing i think is most clear and um it's easiest to to not tangle yourself up in things you can't control and then how you use your money you could invest your money that you made as an investor in all kinds of causes for the good but i wouldn't go as far for myself as saying investing is ethics free or at least that's not how i choose to invest i just try to keep those situations to the minimum because there's no holy place to stand and and things are way more complicated than we think for sure and i wouldn't criticize anyone for just being a a full on capitalist and focus on growing their portfolio as the overriding thing investing as individual so this has been another episode of Wall Street Wildlife we are on YouTube and all the major podcast platforms check out our shiny pdf on wallstreetwildlife.com where you will find the 10 laws of the investing jungle i am at 7 flying platypus and luke is at 7 luke Hallard, are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.